Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Okay. So tell me a little bit about um, when teachers are struggling at the beginning of the year to get their classroom set up. So what are some of the things that you have them do right off the bat to get set up? Right off the bat, I um, make sure that they want to make it a comfortable space for themselves yeah. than for their students. Um, so you want to make it a comfortable space for yourself. What I mean by that is organize your space. So make sure that you have a place for pretty much everything. The same thing that I tell you to do for your students when you walk in and look around as a student, do it as your t as a teacher. When a student hands me something, where am I going to put it? Don't just right. throw it on your desk. I tell teachers, if you have that big pile of papers at the back, shame on you. Shame <laughs> on you. Stop it. Um, get a filing system. Get right. some boxes. What I used to do, honestly, you know, I I've been in the classroom. You don't have a whole bunch of money to just buy all these fancy things. I would get the file folder boxes. And I would take the file folders out and yeah. use them. And then those two, the top and the lid, would be places that I would put handouts and things like that when I made copies of them. Right. You know, just something that simple. And I had a little table, and I was just, it was just full of boxes, and I would throw stuff in the boxes. So just something that simple where it's going to make your life easier when yeah. you have to file papers, when you have to find that assignment. When your students turn in something, they know where to go. You know where to go. So you're making your space comfortable, get all the supplies you need and things like that. And then you make their space comfortable. How, if you're doing alternative seating or regular desk, whatever it is, go ahead and format it in the way you want it formatted before they get there. And then do that walkthrough as a student and make sure mm -hmm. that every question that you have is a routine, is a procedure that you've already thought about. Mm -hmm. That's going to break down a lot of stuff. And then one of the biggest tips I give for the first day of school is, you know, most teachers will have their seating chart. Yeah. No. <laughs> Let your students lead your seating chart. Yeah. Don't do a seating chart on the first day. Interesting. Let them come in, see who's friends, yeah. see who's dating, see who hates each other. <laughs> You'll learn all of that in like the first maybe one or two days. Right. Then break down the seating chart. Yeah. Because in that first two days of school, you are the cool teacher. You're mm -hmm. the one without the seat. Like, oh, yeah, uh-huh. Then that third <laughs> day they come together. in like, Gary, seat one. Mary, seat two. <laughs> And they're like, what? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you'll know, you know, you'll see them holding hands. Okay, they can't sit together. Right. You know, you'll see them talking for five minutes. Okay, but they can't sit together. Right. Can you let them lead your seating chart? Right. Well, okay, tying back to personalized learning for mm -hmm. our students that maybe need to be sitting up front. Maybe we have students that really need to be in an atmosphere where um, they can't have a lot of distractions around them. So what we know best, I know Andy McNair will talk in a little bit about her own seating chart. She has different seating arrangements that she had in her classroom where somebody can sit over here and this, you know, this kind of chair and then over here they had this kind of chair. And there's different ways of a student to be able to engage in their learning Absolutely. that suits them. Um, so what would you say that the teacher can do to still include that? but not restrict the fact that the class gets out of control, you know? So I think it's one of those things where we, we sweat the small stuff. Yeah. So, you know, where, besides a behavior problem, right. where a student sits, like who really cares? Yeah. If they're coming in and they're learning, yeah. you know, who cares if they want to sit on the floor in the corner? Yeah. Who cares if they want to sit in a seat? And who cares if they want to sit at your desk? So you don't right. have anything, you know, that's um, any kind of documentation. Document, yeah, yeah, documents there. But, I mean, who cares? Mm -hmm. So we sweat the small stuff. Let your students sit where they're comfortable. I am a very angle person. I was a very angle child. <laughs> um, so I was one of those people that, you know, once I saw my dream desk, it's almost like Sheldon on the Big like big Bang Theory. That was my <laughs> area. Don't sit in it. You yeah. Know? And if the teacher would move me or something like that, it would throw me completely off. Yeah. So I understand those type of students who see that corner and go, that is where I want to learn from. Yeah. Let them go learn from it. Like Absolutely. Who, I mean, let if they're learning, they're not a behavior problem. Who cares? Right. Let them sit wherever they want to sit. That's a, that's such great advice. I think letting go. You mentioned earlier the fear that as teachers we feel because we feel pressured to have everything together, know everything. You know, our teachers, our students can't know more than us, and um, that we have to have everything right and everything perfect and. And really letting go classroom management doesn't mean that you're letting go of your classroom skills of you're letting your kids go wild it means that you have learned you've taken the extra time you've made those adaptions to their needs 
that doesn't distract, you know, or take away from their time and their energy and their focus, but that it helped them to be more efficient with the time that they do have. Absolutely. Because it is about them. Yeah. You know, yeah. we're there because of them. Yeah. If all students went away one day, we would not have a job. So yeah. we are there for them. We are there for their learning. Do you think students desire classroom management? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's one of the first things I do in my classroom management class is that they desire, they crave structure. Yeah. You know, even if they hate you for it, they crave it. And yeah. sometimes, honestly, you're the only one that's giving them structure in yeah. their life. And they, they need that. They're craving it. Mm -hmm. um, it does tell them that they are loved. Yeah. You know, and I used to tell my students, you should be offended mm -hmm. when you go into a classroom that the teacher just like, oh, do whatever you want to. That should offend you. Yeah. You know, you, you should be offended by that. Yeah. Like, you don't care enough to teach me. Right. You know, that you, you that's not a good thing. It's not a party time. Right. You know, and my students kind of got it. Like, you know, you're right. That's not, even though I'm sure they didn't say anything, but you know, they yeah, understood sure that. that they that's, did. You know, that's. Because you know what? There, I have seen times where students have stood up and said, you know what? You're not doing your job. Yes. And and I not, you know, there are times where there's disrespectful times where you don't want a student standing up and disrespecting yeah. a class. Well, I used to teach my students it's a time and a place for everything. Exactly. Even with me. I would say I would I I want you to just like I question you on everything, they they can never just say an answer without me saying why. Yep. They knew that. They had to come. So I'm like, just like that, you can question me on what yeah. I'm doing, but there is a time and a place for everything. Sure. That's a good call. That's you know, a really good so that's call. That's what I used to teach them. Come like in, in the middle of a test, you yell exactly. <laughs> that's not that's not the that's not the right thing. And just I mean, like little things like setting up your rules in the in the beginning. I tell teachers you really only have one rule in your class. Everything mm -hmm. is like a it's like a, a vision. Everything should revolve around that one rule, whatever that rule is for you. For me it was respect. I used to teach my students that everything falls under respect. Do so you yeah. respect me? You're going to have your supplies. Do so you respect the class? You're going to do your work. Like everything falls under respect. Is really, you don't need any other rule. Right. You know, and I used to break it down to them. Um, I used to tell them, you know, think about that, that adult that you really respect and how you act around them. And then think about that adult you don't respect, you know, and they'll start giggling. You know the difference. Yeah. You know the difference. So let, let's not pretend with each other, you know, and I would tell them, you know, who's ever heard, if you respect me, I'll respect you. And they all yeah. raise their hands. And I go, it's not a choice yeah. in here. It's not an option. We're going to respect each other. Right. And if you can't deal with that, you need to go change your schedule. Like, I love you. I'll see you next year or something. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's one of those kind of things where it's like, we're not going to have a choice in here. That's not yeah. how we play things in this classroom. Right. So I, I think just setting up, but I had that all done ahead of time. You know, right. I had it wasn't fly by night. I worked my butt off at the beginning to make sure that all of those kind of things were set up. Yeah. And you're still going to have those outliers, you know, you're still going to have those students that, that misbehave mm -hmm. and naturally that relationship will come in, yes. you know, where you can pull them out and I call it the Cosby show talk. You know, sometimes these kids have never heard you can do better. Yeah. Sometimes these kids have never heard. I love you. You'd be surprised. Like you'd think, oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. sometimes they haven't. You yeah. know, and if you have that relationship with the student, instead of saying, you know, blah, 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 saying I'm disappointing, it will crush them. Mm -hmm. That's when you truly have a relationship with a student. Right. You can say, I'm just, you know, I'm just disappointing. And what's going it will, it will hurt their world. And that's yeah. when you know you have that relationship yeah. with the student. And then if it comes down to it, if it's a student you, you, you don't have a relationship with yeah. and they're still misbehaving, then you may have to go through some routes, like riding them up. You know, I don't like to. I know. Yeah, so that's like teachers, the last like, resort, like, really. Yeah, yeah. You should never have to get to that. There's so many other ways. Yeah. When I would ride a student it. up, they would get suspended because yeah. I never wrote students yeah. up. You know, know, it's like it's always something else. Right. Most of the time, there's something else that you can do. Right. Absolutely. Well, I will tell you that I'm inspired by you. Uh, you when you speak about things, I really hear your passion. I hear your love for your students. I hear your love for educators and really wanting to make sure that the classroom is the best place yes. that it can be. So I appreciate you sharing your knowledge and of your course. expertise in this I want community. To say two more things if I can. Please, yes. Okay. One is a part of personalized learning is also giving your students choice. Yeah. So not just like the room setup and the physical things, but just like little things. So if you're not comfortable with doing more open things yeah. for, for personalized learning, give them a choice in assignments. You know, start there. Mm -hmm. So when you have an assignment and you, you, you know what you want to actually see that they learn, come up with a list of five things that they can do 
where they can actually choose which how to show you that they've learned that skill. So yeah. start start small. If if it's if it's um you know kind of you are a little afraid of doing yeah. the whole personalized learning thing. Start small and give them start giving them options. Start giving them student voice. Let them teach a lesson. Mm-hmm. You know just little stuff like that gives your students authority. Gives your students um value value yeah you're showing them how much learning. you believe in them yeah you're showing how much you see in them and you're giving them the opportunity to shine you exactly. know so and to my teacher leaders and to my administrators personalized learning is not just for students it's also for your teachers so on those professional development days can i do a presentation about yeah. that too um please don't do one size fits all we, we tell teachers not to do it. We shouldn't be modeling that for teachers. So Absolutely. teachers should have a choice in what different sessions they go to. Even if it's a regular PD day on one day, they should have options of where they go. Because if I already know Google Forms, why am I sitting through Google Forms again? I could be going, <laughs> I could be going to level two of Google Forms and yeah. learn something a little bit deeper. And I know principals and, and teacher leaders who will say, well, you know, how do I get all these presenters? That You have people on your campus. That's right. Start, start in them. yeah, start giving them some some leadership roles. Start building up your people. And Desiree has started an ed camp yes. in Louisiana. And how has that been? How have the oh, teachers amazing. responded? We just had it uh, last weekend. Uh, it's ed camp in L.A., just the regular in L.A., up for North Louisiana. And it was amazing. We had about 75 teachers show up. And yeah. this one was concentrated on uh, Head Start through three, but we had some middle school and high school teachers show up as well. Nice. And it was amazing. Wow. We had a, a good old time. Yeah. Yes. It was it was very, very good. The news came out. It was it was nice. Wow. It was a very nice event and the teachers really loved it. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Do you want to get in touch with Desiree? Yes. I'm gonna let her share how to get in touch with her, where you can find her. Okay, well, my website is educatoralexander.com. It has everything on it, all my social media, my email address, which is just educatoralexander at gmail.com. <laughs> um, on Twitter, I'm at educatoralex. I didn't have enough characters to do Educator Alexander. <laughs> but on every other social media, I'm Educator Alexander. So they can find me on my website. There's a whole bunch of free stuff, um, uh, free tools, webinars on my YouTube channel, mm-hmm. just a whole bunch of stuff. I have a couple of webinars coming up. Uh, this month is on Google extensions. Yeah. Uh, next month is on how to become an educational leader in Louisiana specifically. Yeah. But a whole bunch of free stuff. You just have to register. So yeah. take, take a take a take a second to look at the website and get all this free stuff off of it. And okay. you can sign up for my newsletter. I sing it out once a month. Nice. Yeah. Well, she is part of a vibrant learning ambassador community that is actually going to continue on. We have guests coming all throughout TCEA coming to share their passion, expertise, and knowledge. And um, we are so thankful to have them part of the community. And she is one of our latest learning ambassadors that has joined the team and has just been rocking and rolling, just supporting the learning. And we appreciate you so much. And thank you for heading the team and creating all these these possibilities. Oh, I'm so excited to be a part of this. All right, guys, we have Andy McNair coming with us next. I'm going to put us on pause and so excited to keep the learning going, guys. Yes.
All right, here we are again at Who Knew It Live at TC. Okay, I all right, we are here with a very special friend, Andy McNair. I always tell people I'm always like, I'm friends with Andy McNair. Oh I gosh. know her. I'm so proud to be friends with her. I feel the same way. Oh well, you know what, Andy. I talk to her very regularly. We collaborate through Voxer. Mm -hmm. And um, as we're collaborating, one of the things that we talk about often is Genius Hour and how she takes that and runs with it and shares it to the masses. She is working on her second book under the topic. And um, I think it's just gonna be so cool to talk to her about what is happening in Genius Hour. What is Genius Hour? How do you bring that to your classroom? And if we even need to explain how that's connected to personalized learning, we don't need to. Right. Everything about it is personalized learning. What it is. Fantastic. So Andy, go ahead and introduce yourself, share what you do, Awesome. how awesome you are. <laughs> okay. Just... Um, so I'm Andy McNair and I am a digital innovation specialist at ESC Region 12. Um, and then also travel around and talk about things like Genius Hour and you know, just creating and designing meaningful learning experiences for students and um, just love learning from others and then taking that and talking about how it can be used in the classroom to just do what's best for today's generation, this generation of learners that we have in our classroom. But they're yeah. so different than some of the learners that we've had before. And so I think that mindset shift and doing things differently is really exciting. Like it's a very cool time to be an educator right yeah. now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Sure. So much opportunity to do things different. Mm -hmm. Um, which is, you know, you can say that's frustrating or that's amazing, but ultimately it's necessary, right? So share a little bit about what Genius Hour is. Give somebody that has zero clue into what that is. Yeah, so Genius Hour is basically giving students an opportunity during the school day to pursue their passion. Um, and I feel like it's a perfect opportunity to allow students to learn the standards or learn whatever it is that you need them to learn by doing, right? what better way to learn something than to weave it into what they're passionate about and so i believe in genius hour with everything in me i think that it is one of the coolest ways best ways to teach um, because when you see students learning through their passions in my classroom that was how i taught and that's what we did and when my students connected the standards to what they were passionate about that's when like real learning happened and when we really saw those light bulbs go off so what was the starting point for you when you were like, I need to write a book about this. This is necessary to get this information out this way for teachers. So I think um, I was sharing Genius Hour some. I had met really cool people like Don Wetrick and AJ Giuliani and all of those guys and uh, Joy Kerr and was hearing and learning from them. And for me in my class, we really needed a process. So like Genius Hour was really big for my kids. And so they were saying things like, you know, well, what do I do next? Or I'm not sure where to go next. And I wanted it to be personalized and I wanted them to figure it out, but it was just too big. And so we needed a process. And so we developed something called the six P's of Genius Hour. And so as we developed that, we came up with passion, plan, pitch, project, product, and presentation. And I went in one day and I uh, created a bulletin board to kind of walk them through the process, snapped a picture of that bulletin board, put it on Twitter, and turned out a lot of people were looking for a process for Genius Hour. And so as we, as I shared that out and started talking to educators and sharing it at conferences, um, I just realized that lots of people wanted to do Genius Hour. They just needed a way to make it work for them that wasn't so big. And um, yeah, and so then I wrote the book and, and it's been crazy. So it's been fun though. <laughs> Well, what you don't know is she's working on her second book now, which she said she never wanted to write another book. And right. as soon as it was done, it was like, we're doing this again. <laughs> so it's so great. For so sure. great. Okay. Genius Hour. And uh, let's say, what does that look like? Share one an example of what you've seen your students do with Genius Hour. Yeah. So one of the stories I always like to tell that I think kind of really shows what Genius Hour, what students can do, the connections they can make. We use the passion bracket from AJ Giuliani. And so... One side of the passion bracket are things that I love and one side are things that bother me because I think the difference between a passion and an interest is that a passion usually stems from something that you want to see change, mm -hmm. right? So I'm passionate about change in education because I want to see a change. Um, and so for my students, it was the same thing. What is something that bothers you? And what is something, you know, what are some things that you love? And they would fill out that bracket. 
And then when they would have two things that would come together. So like a student might have, I love technology. Something that really bothers me is bullying. They might create a video game about bullying to share out with the world. That is um, so cool. Yeah, and then personalizing that and then weaving the standards into that. So as they're working on that, if I know my standards well, I can walk around and really personalize how they learn those standards and having those conversations with them and just teaching it in a very real moment mm -hmm. rather than just having them regurgitate on a worksheet because if you can do that, congratulations. But if you can't apply it in a real situation, you know, what is that going to look like later? Yeah, definitely. So is there, what kind of resources have you needed in order to make sure that you're okay. taking Genius Hour and it's effective in a class? Like, I know okay. that you have talked to me about the community, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. reaching out to the community, getting the support, because sometimes some of the topics that they're talking about is something that you can't provide or somebody you know can't provide. So like, what do you do about that? Right, I think outside experts, that's definitely something I'm probably most passionate about, no matter what you're doing in the classroom, whether it's Genius Hour, in order to help them make that connection between, hey, here's what we're doing in the classroom and the real world, which the classroom is the real world, but really simulating that and helping them make those connections I think talking to outside experts is huge. That's when that happens, those connections really happen and they start to realize, oh my goodness, all these things that we're learning, this person that does something that I'm passionate about actually uses and actually yeah. does. I think for my students, when I watch them talk to outside experts and they would look at me when the outside expert would talk about how they converted measurements or how they use fractions, yeah. and my students would look at me like, Oh my gosh like they really do that <laughs> they actually yes. use their math <laughs> uh, like math is a real thing we're going to do after this yes turns out it is so yeah. um i think outside experts connecting using things like nepris um mm -hmm. i think just we use the help wanted wall which i have a blog post about but just help finding those experts anywhere within your community but the great thing now is that we have even like we're doing right now you know being able to zoom yeah. online our students really have the ability to connect with anybody anywhere at any time. And so I think harnessing that power in your classroom and helping them realize that is huge. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. So can you think of, I, I keep trying to like, I, I'm waiting for this story, right? Yeah. Tell me a story about when genius hour was like, what, where have you been on my life? Like when that aha moment happened with genius hour. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of people have heard this story, but I had one student who was super quiet uh, very kept to herself, did not like a whole lot of uh, human interaction. She just liked to do her thing. And she had worked on a website for a long time and uh, over probably a period of six or seven weeks had worked on her Genius Hour project, which was a website. We had gone on a personal field trip. I had, her mom had met me at Arabian, an Arabian horse farm. We had gone and taken pictures and she accidentally deleted her website. And she brought me her computer and she said, hey, I deleted my website. And I thought, oh my gosh, there's no way you could have done that. Like, you know, let me look at it. I looked at it and she had deleted her website. So we had a whole conversation about, I gave her the whole talk about failure and struggle and how you learn through the struggle, you know, and she goes back to her desk and she's in tears, you know, she's really upset because she's having to start over. Um, but she goes and she works and I think she's working on our project all this time because I told her, you know, we have to just start over, we're just gonna learn through it. Anyway, she comes back up to my desk about 30 minutes later and she said, hey, Miss McNair, will you call this phone number? And um, I couldn't see who I was calling and she had created her website on Weebly. And when I called the phone number and they answered the phone, they said Weebly headquarters. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, like, and so I'm looking at her like, I'm calling Weebly head. She was like, just ask them if they can fix it. I was like, well, they can't. Just ask. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a fourth grader at the time. And so uh, I said, well, apparently my student thinks that you guys can fix this. And uh, you know, I'm trying to tell her, I don't think they can. And I kind of turned my chair around where she couldn't hear me and I kind of whispered to Weebly, you know, hey, I just need you guys to play along here because it's a good learning opportunity. Anyway, she puts me on hold and she said, can you hang on just a second? And I said, yes. Um, and then they came back and asked for her username and password and we gave it to them. They put us on hold and then they told her to log out and log back in. And when she did, her website was for an event. So I always tell that story because Genius Hour and personalized learning is very much about empowerment, right? Empowering our learners to take control of their own learning. And so she could have been super compliant and said, yes, ma'am, and gone and started over on her website. But I always say like, can you imagine what she must've been thinking as she walked back to her desk after I had suggested that she start completely over? She probably oh thought, God. you go ahead and think that I'm doing that, but I'm gonna go find a number for Weebly and we're gonna call them. Oh my and God. so sure enough, but I think that that's what it does. It moves them from compliance 
and really to that empowerment. You know, the, and the old teacher six years ago, I, I know I would have said to her, you know, what did I ask you to do? I asked you to start on your website. I'm not calling this phone number because you didn't do what I asked you to do because six years ago, I expected compliance. But yeah. after making Genius Hour and true personalized learning a priority, I wanted them to be empowered. And yeah. so it wasn't about, you know, what I had told her to do. It was about her finding another way and doing it. You know, um, I'm going to share a story with you if that's all right. So um, Mary Alice Curran, mm -hmm. you know Mary yes. Alice, we'll be together tonight for dinner. Yes, cannot wait. Um, and Mary Alice has a son, Curran, goes out and speaks and has a chance to travel and share all the time. Yeah. He's been a keynote speaker, TEDx speaker. He's fantastic. He's 11. Um, and Mary Alice shares the story about her son who recently had a project this year and was told to put, what is the project called when you put it in a shoebox? Oh, like a, uh, oh my goodness. We all know what we're talking about. Shoebox project, It's going right? to come to me after this. I, yes, know, I know, I know. Diorama. Yes, diorama. Okay. He had to do a diorama and it had to show specific, you know, criteria, it had all these different things that he had to do. So he goes up to his teacher and says, I really want to share this in Minecraft. Is it okay if I share this in Minecraft? And the teacher said, no, you have to show it in the shoebox. That's part of the requirement. It's on, you know, it's on my rubric. You're going to have to do this. So he goes back and I just see some friends that are already walking down here that we're going to get really excited. So, hey, who knew it live? Yeah. Woo. So we're seeing some great friends here. We've been meeting some incredible people. So we're talking about Mary Alice right now and her son who had to do a shoebox project and was told he couldn't do Minecraft. So he came back to his house and he said, mom, I really wanted to do Minecraft in my diorama instead of this diorama shoebox thing. But my teacher told me no. So Mary Alice connected with Amy Storer, oh, yes. who was also on yesterday and said, hey, um, let me ask you this. This is what's happening. I'm super frustrated with this teacher. Why would she restrict my son? And Amy came up with the brilliant idea, put a QR code inside yes. of the shoebox. So Curran said, yes, I'm gonna do this. He went out and made a whole Minecraft world, completely made a whole video describing everything that he made in Minecraft and how he made it and how he was describing every aspect of the project. Came back, had paint, you know, did a little bit inside the shoebox, but that QR code's there. He went and gave it to his teacher and she failed him. The teacher failed Curran on that student, on that assignment. And then she came back and she said, you know what? The project was you making a 3D representation of this. This isn't 3D. And he said, I know it's 4D. So for him to come back yes. and be empowered to stand for his ground, his mom was couldn't have been prouder. It was a fantastic moment of describing the fact that our students are ready and eager to embrace their passion. Yes. Like when have you seen a student really thriving from Genius Hour? Yeah, you know, I had a student who struggled. I actually had him a couple of years because I taught GT and so I had him, you know, when he was in third grade and then again in fourth grade. And he was a student who really struggled with behavior in the classroom. I mean, all of his other teachers would come talk to me about how he wasn't behaving. And, you know, he was just such a difficult student. And it was hard for me because I never saw any of that, right? When we were working on Genius Hour, I didn't have a behavior problem out of him. Yeah. And so it was just realizing that he was so passionate about some things. He just needed a way to get it out. Like he just needed a place for that to come out. Uh, and I think so many of our learners, whether they're gifted, whether they're a struggling student, no matter what type of student they are, they deserve an opportunity to pursue that passion. It shouldn't be at home. So many of them have other things they have to do, whether it be chores or athletics, but really giving them an opportunity during their school day, they deserve at least that. Um, you know, and I'm not so sure the Genius Hour eventually, passion-based learning doesn't become the way that we teach, right? Because what better way to help students make connections than through what they're passionate about? This is, this is great. You know, we talk about personalized learning for educators too. And what do you think Genius Hour could be applicable for when it comes to even PD? How do you adjust your PD to make sure it's, it's really personalized for that educator? Yeah, I think it's important. You know, we're really doing a lot of work right now with PD and talking to educators. And we actually took some educators in our region through Genius Hour because as an educator, if you can figure out what it is that bothers you about education and what you're passionate about and make those connections, when you're passionate in the classroom, it's 
going to be a better day for your students, right? But if you come in, you know, Don Wetrick, I've heard him say before, you know, if you're bored teaching it, how much more boring is it to watch you do it, right? So, but if you come in and you're passionate and you're excited um, about what you're sharing, I think that that impacts your students. So I think even educators need to go through that process of, you know, what is it that I really love that I want to bring into my classroom and, you know, connect with my students on that level and help them understand that, hey, this is what I'm passionate about. This is how we're going to learn and then allow the kids to do the same thing. So, You know, um, I'm going to share a little story that I loved going to carnivals and I took the concept of playing math games and said, kids hate fractions, right? So that's like typically seen as a negative. Um, and so when I would share fractions, I would tie it into carnivals and I made a fraction carnival and we play games which was my thing. That's the way I love presenting it. But yeah. some kids were really scared when I dressed up as a clown. So, <laughs> as, much as, I, as much as I loved it, by the end of the day, when all the makeup's draining down and the kids are afraid, it was like scary <laughs> fraction carnival day, you know? Um, but you know, sometimes for educators, we forget about having fun and just enjoying and loving what we do. Um, we get burdened down with all the monotony of all the little pieces that we got to accomplish. But I love Genius Hour because it's reviving, mm -hmm. it's reviving our students. It's reviving us. We get to see the best of the best come out of our students. So what, how, how would somebody get started? Like, where do they even begin? You know, I think there's so many resources online. So hashtag Genius Hour on Twitter for sure. Um, I think that connecting with people that, you know, that's when everything changed for me was when I really started connecting with educators that were like-minded and that believed in change in education. And I was really at a place where I was almost done with education. I was about to get out um, because what I was doing wasn't meaningful for me or my students. And I always say, you know, if it's not meaningful for your students, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time and theirs. So um, I think that really making connections with people, whether it be on Twitter, whether how it, whatever that looks like. Um, but hashtag Genius Hour, you can Google Genius Hour um, on my website, andymcnair.com. I have a uh, link to Genius Hour with tons of books, tons of resources that you can access. But I think you just do it, right? You just jump in and do it and be okay with failure, right? Because our students need to see that. Um, and I think it's just about getting out of their way and letting them do. Because when you get out of their way, some of those students that you think aren't capable of doing what you need them to do, will show you that not only are they capable of doing what you need them to do, they're capable of doing so much more. They're just waiting for you to give them the opportunity. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, I've been able to personally witness what that looks like virtually. Mm -hmm. So sharing out uh, virtual events, seeing kids from around the world given the opportunity, they make their best of the best when they feel like they have an authentic audience. Yep. So how do you allow your students to really share out what they do, what they create, so that other people can see how amazing that they are. You know, we just shared out, and I have people ask me all the time, like, well, what about parents that are uncomfortable with that? And I think it's just having those real conversations of, you know, social media isn't going away. And, and I know I, I have learned from so many educators that social media should be a way for them to promote themselves positively. And either they're going to use it that way or they're going to use it in a negative way. And so instead of acting like it doesn't exist or act, acting like, uh, it's not our responsibility to teach them that it is somebody's got to but instead of doing that really letting them share their work out whether that be on Twitter whether it be a website that you have that you share out whether it be on a digital portfolio but I feel like giving students an opportunity to do that uh, kind of shifts that mindset from social media being a place to share every single thing that I do and say mm -hmm. to when they make that connection between wait a minute, I shared out a project and somebody important really saw it and not only did they see it, but they commented on yeah. it. Now they start realizing people are really looking at this and it can make a difference in my life. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Is there any parents that have resisted that that maybe turned full circle to see why that yeah. was a good thing? I feel like I had a couple who were a little hesitant. Um, and then once they realized, you know, we talked about, you know, we're not going to put our last names. We're not going to share what school we go to. We had very specific things that we weren't going to do but my students um, I feel like the parents that I talked to once we sat down and had that conversation they started realizing you know I always just said either let me teach them unless you're going to teach them how to do it in a positive way give me the opportunity to do that and once we had those conversations 
most of them did come full circle. But it's it's a hard conversation to have, but I think as educators, it's something we have to be talking about right now. Absolutely. And the age of our students really matters. So Mm -hmm. let's say we have our younger students that are embracing Genius Hour. What would you say that youngest age for Genius Hour begins? I think it starts at, I mean, I think kindergarten can definitely do things like a Wonder Wall. I'm a huge fan of Wonderopolis, by the way. They're here at PCA. And uh, just letting them explore different wonders and having a Wonder Wall where they post that and then you guys go on Wonderopolis and look at that. Or um, doing a passion project together, going through the six piece together. But I think Genius Hour works in kindergarten through, I mean, seniors. I think, and, and then in high school, it really starts to look like internships, right? And I always say that as a mom, I don't want to wait until I'm paying for it for my kids to decide what they want to do with their lives. Let's decide that before we go to college, what you're passionate about, instead of waiting until I'm paying for it and being wishy-washy about what we want to do. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Is there anything you want to help teachers do to get started? I know you have a book. Yeah. And that is a great beginning start. I know you have a website where Mm -hmm. people get connected to you. Maybe you can share how to get connected to you and some tips on getting started as they embrace Genius Hour. Yeah, so I tweet a lot uh, at McNair AN3. Um, and then my website, andymcnair.com. And then I have a blog where I, I recently just wrote about how to use Flipgrid with Genius Hour and um, just different ideas as we talk about how to make it really manageable for educators and then meaningful for our students. So the blog is a meaningful mess. <laughs> dot blogspot.com because that's exactly what my classroom was, right? It was a mess. I mean, it always was, but it was a meaningful mess. And I always tell teachers, like, it's okay for things to be messy right now. I think if you're comfortable teaching this generation, you might be doing it wrong because we should be uncomfortable because they're so, it's so different right now. But oh my gosh, it's such a cool time mm-hmm. to be in education. That's so funny. Educator Alexander. So we have uh, Desiree who just spoke, was talking about organization as being key. So, you know, for her in like, classroom management, mess. I know. So it's really interesting to hear how the different topics bring about different opportunities yes. and that a mess doesn't necessarily mean that you're not organized in right. some way, shape or form and your kids are out of control. Right. It just means that there's purpose, like you said, there, it's meaningful in the time and you're okay with letting go of having control over every little aspect. Yeah, and you know, one of the definitions of a mess is just something being difficult or confusing. And I feel like right now, that's how some educators feel. It's hard right now, it's not easy. And so figuring that out is a little messy for everybody. It definitely doesn't have to mean a literal mess, uh, but it is a little bit difficult and sometimes confusing right now, but being willing to take those risks and do crazy things in the classroom to reach this generation of kids, so worth it. And I. I just think it's such a cool time and even being here at TCEA and seeing all of the all of the things we have the opportunity to bring into our classroom right now. Very, very cool. Very cool. All right. She is incredible. If you're not connected with Andy McNair, you need to be. She is an incredible resource, a value, and a fantastic PLN member, as well as a great friend. Yes. And I've been saying. trying to recruit her for this learning ambassador program because she is just golden and I love her heart. So would love for you guys to connect with her and learn from her and thank you andy so much for sharing because it is a wonderful conversation lots to think about as educators and ready to move forward so up next we have the talented the wonderful nicole taylor and i'm going to pause we're going to get set up and we'll be back here soon thanks guys. guys
our video and audio. <laughs> hey, we are at Who Knew It Live at TCES. Hey. Oh. All right, we're excited because we just have a whole day of awesome. I mean, I feel like everybody that comes up here, I'm like, I can't believe I get to talk to these people because they're so fantastic. And you know what we did? We said two different groups, two different topics. And you know what? We're going to bring them together because both of them have some incredible things to share right now. So Nicole is really focused on the admin side and what that means for personalized learning. And boy, do we need to talk to our admin about personalized learning for educators for sure. And then we also have Mason talking about fostering creativity. And that I think is really just a foundation of personalized le learning in general for our classroom and for our educators and for our admin, right? Great. So I'm going to let you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves a little bit, share what you do, and then I'm going to get into some questioning. Hey guys, <laughs> I'm Nicole Taylor. I'm a blended learning specialist with Lancaster ISD. It's right outside of Dallas, Texas. In this role, I support teachers and students from pre-K through sixth grade with all things digital teaching and learning. And hello everyone, I'm Mason. I'm an educator from North Texas. Uh, I'm a former secondary English language arts and reading teacher um, uh, out of Dallas ISD, Plano ISD and Garland ISD. Uh, the whole resume? I know the whole thing. <laughs> um, but now I am uh, an education technology national instructor for ed tech teacher. Um, I get to support students and teachers K through 12 on technology integration through things like iPads, um, Chromebooks, and pedagogical frameworks like design thinking, project-based learning, and personalized learning. Woo. So he does everything. Yes, so, pretty much. Oh my gosh. So what's crazy is this group of people are both, they're both learning ambassadors. We get to connect and collaborate in a community of learning ambassador program that really are all over the place. There's nobody that I can say, you two are exactly the same. You both offer the same thing. Everybody's bringing a specialty, a passion, um, experience and really just bringing so much to the learning ambassador program because everybody's able to share that with one another. Um, we even had Claudio Duvall that he'll be here tomorrow doing the interviewing and when he was here he's like here's a microphone you know so it was like he was there helping to support this regardless and I just love the fact that we have such a giving community. All right we're going to get started first about um, thinking about what our teachers need in their personalized learning. So if as, as administrators who are making decisions for, you know, how our teachers need to, what kind of trainings that they need, uh, the direction, the initiatives that are happening in the district. So what are some of the things that a teacher foundationally needs in their PD? So we'll start off with you, Nicole. I really think they need a voice. Mm. Um, I think that we have to get away from PD being something that we do to teachers right and really sit down and see what are your what are your needs like what what is it that you want to learn mm -hmm. um what i've noticed in my district with the teachers that i support is when we sit down and we have that initial conversation mm -hmm. if i support them that's our first conversation what is it that you feel like you need and then um how can i support it um what i've noticed is like that there has to be a shift so um i think that is what i've noticed has been the, the greatest need is just giving teachers the power to make their own PD choices. Um, I've just seen once I give them the power, it's easy to go back and match what it is they want to learn with the needs of students and the mission and the vision of the district. But um, if anything, I would just say they need that freedom. They need that power to make those choices. Absolutely. Which is why you're also passionate about Ed Camp. Right. I love the camp. I know. Yeah. And I know Mason's right there with you, but Mason. We've been gonna... a few of them together. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just a few, you know, <laughs> one or two. I've gone to her. She's coming on. Uh, yeah. yeah. They've been to about 10 or 20 of them or together. 30. I think I had number 30 last Saturday. <laughs> no. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> okay. And there was one last weekend in Louisiana. Uh, educator Alexander, so Desiree oh, cool. hosted one in Louisiana cool. for the first time, and so it's that K, K through third grade. She said it was fantastic. They had oh. news there and everything. People were wow. really, really excited to embrace them. Cool. Uh, yeah, definitely. Mason, I'm going to ask you from um, a classroom perspective, because as far as fostering creativity, as an educator that is now trying to do that in the classroom, what are the tools that an educator needs in order to allow their students to be creative? Okay, I'm going to answer that question, but I did want to jump on the yeah. question because Get on my question, it's, it's funny that you, <laughs> you asked her that question because I'm writing a book and this is not me plugging my book, but it goes yeah. along with, uh, it's about transforming professional development. It's about taking professional development to new heights. Um, my book is called Plain PD, 
P-L-A-N-E. Uh, it's a play on the word plane uh, because we want to help teachers to soar through personalized PD. Uh, it's actually an acronym. The P is for PD that is personalized, PD that is learner inspired, P that is aerodynamic, AKA it's well-designed, PD that's in is needed, and then the E is engaging. Um, these are things that we need to start doing to make the professional development better for our teachers. And again, starts with that personalization for them so that they can personalize education for students. Now, in terms of what they need for um, fostering creativity for their students is they need to, and this is hard guys, this is really hard. They need to let go and let the kids create. One of the things that we have a tendency to do in the classroom is we always push content out for our students to consume. And they're always consuming, 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 but we forget about letting the, our kids take the information that they're taking in and letting them create with it. So we need a spectrum. We need to go from the consumption to the creation. Now that they have consumed, what do we want them to produce with this information so that students can show us what do they know, what do they think, what do they feel, what do they understand, but more importantly, where are the breakdowns in understanding so that we can then do reteaches, so that we can then um, reframe our lessons, so that we can use the feedback loop, so that we can make uh, the learning better and make it stick for the kids. Yeah, and what I, I wanted, what he was, when he was talking, I just thought, Teachers have to experience that too. They do. They um, because do. I think, you know, I, I know that's what's good for kids. Um, and as a parent, like that's what I want for my kids. That's what I want for the students that I support. But when you tell a teacher, give kids voice and choice, but this is how you're going to do it. This is when you're going to do it. Yeah. This is what, so they have to experience that in order to turn it around and, and give it to kids. Give them voice and choice. What do you want to learn? How do you want to learn it? How are you going to apply it? How can I support you? What do I need to go? Reteach, and what you'll see is they'll just once they've experienced it, they will yeah. flip that over and turn it over and 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 give it give it to kids. Yeah, and it's funny that you say that because that's what I always do. I'm like, okay, guys, today you are going to play the role of student, mm -hmm. and that's hard because we're used to being in control. Yes, and then we're also used to just being lectured to. Yeah. So when I then put forth challenges, I'm like, okay, now here's that thing. You know, we tell our kids. I want you to have a growth mindset. I get teachers, I'm like, okay, now I want you to have a growth mindset. I want you to think outside the box. I want you to have that innovator's mindset and think a little differently about the approaches that we use in education. Yeah. But I'm, that means I'm gonna put you in this low. And that becomes difficult for them because they have never experienced it before. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a shift because it's not how we learn. Yeah. So when yeah. we were in school, no. the teacher was in the front, the teacher knew everything. And now I can, my last group of kids that I taught a pre-honors, um, a pre-honors, sixth grade class, I'd give him, I gave him a syllabus, Halal, I will never forget Halal. Halal lived to teach himself the lesson before I got there. Like th these are the kind of kids that we're teaching. Yeah. They're not waiting on us. They're, they, they're not waiting on us. And so we really need to put that same mindset in teachers. Like don't wait on me, find an ed camp, yeah. read a book, do, you know, listen to a podcast and then tell me how I can support you putting that in your class. That's fantastic. Because You're sure we're not on mute today, right? <laughs> I heard you on mute before? No, the, Earlier, was for twenty here? minutes. Oh, that was nobody hilarious. knows because that was that was deleted. Thank you. Oh, oh. <laughs> they know now. Oops. Woo. I just have to make sure because we have some good conversation, <laughs> yeah, good. and I want everyone to hear good. it. This is good. We know how to edit that stuff too. Okay, but you know, um, one of the things you guys are really drawn out is the the shift in, and not just for our classrooms, for our educators. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean for administrators? Like, what does that mean that they need to now do in order to make that work both for their students and for their teachers? Um, so in, in my district this year, I got a new director in October. I kind of have two directors, a new one and an old one. Um, we kind of all work together. <laughs> old, old, yeah. or just? Uh, and older than last year, because I'm pretty okay. new and strong. Um, but we read um, the personalized PD book yeah. by, by Jason. I can't think of Jason's last name. It begins with a uh -oh. B. Sorry. Hey, Jason. Um, and that book along with ed camps like that book is like a life changer so i said i actually had the desk sitting on i had the book sitting on my desk and right next door to me um, where my office is housed at the high school is the early college high school principal and she goes hey i saw that you were sharing about this very book on twitter 
I want to read it with you. And I was like, that would be great. Wow. Bring some of your principal friends with you. Very intentional. And so what we ended, what ended up happening is we had a book study on these, these um, you know, these tenets of personalized PD, how to do it and how easy it is um, that it included principals and central office admin. And so what, what I saw is the, as we read, um, like my director, she went ahead and she created a Google Classroom. Um, some of the student support officers are like, hey, we need to get some of this Google certification. And so kind of as they experience it, I think you just have to be open to admit what you don't know yeah. and open to learn. And I, that, that word that you, that control word, like I keep hearing that control, like who, I don't want to be in control of every of everything. I mean, you just miss so many you know, authentic learning opportunities yeah. when everything has to be, we know in school there has to be order, but I mean, it's, it's okay to say, hey, you know, I don't know how to do this and seek out opportunities to learn. I love when I go to an ed camp and we introduce, you know, you introduce in every session and I hear someone say, oh, I'm a principal. And I'm like, yes, because you need to go. Yeah. You, you need to go. You need to be open to learn. And what does that mean for our students then? How can students stand up and start demonstrating the need, our teachers demonstrating the need to be personalized to our admin, what kind of opportunities should they be given based on that they can share? Honestly, um, giving them options, showing them here are the things that you have available to you. Um, and you can now choose from these things uh, and show me what you know. Um, and providing a variety so I'll, I'll give you an example. So I was a, an English teacher and I used to always think that the only way my students can show me what they knew was through writing. Um, but when I started to reflect, I'm like, we have the technology. Um, we have all of these uh, different tools at our disposal. Um, and my student objective is not a writing objective. So why am I requiring my students to go one medium to show me what they know when they can show me that they understand theme and they understand main idea and characterization and inferencing they can show me through these other modalities and allowing them hey here you can use this recording app and you can make a podcast here you can use toast faces yes <laughs> or, or, or here, here's a whole box of goodies you just decide yes figure yeah. out what you want to use yeah. show me what you're yeah. capable yeah. of doing so i don't know about every tool yeah right yeah, yeah. That's crazy awesome. I, I love that because we're not restricted, really, as teachers. I think we feel restricted sometimes. Mm -hmm. And we look at the curriculum and we say, gosh, I have no flexibility. There's no freedom. How in the world can I teach that? But the truth is, you can't. There is no curriculum out there that will allow you to really share out everything. You know what? It takes creativity. Yes. Right. It takes the teacher stepping outside of what is written down in that paper and really embracing what isn't written. And that's letting your students, your teachers shine in a way that they're capable because that one person that wrote that curriculum or that group of people, they're not as powerful as all of your students and all of your staff, right? They can do it, they're it's capable. A plan. And plans are all, I always think of the curriculum as a plan, a guide, and uh, or like when you go on a road trip, you know, yeah. you, you was, know where you're, yeah, going. you're going, but yeah. you may have some pit stops, you yeah. may have, it's just a plan, and plan are meant to be. And sometimes the tire plan. pops. Right. Yes. And that's okay. Yeah. But what happens too often, though, is the tire pops, and people just keep rolling. They keep going through. <laughs> you know, when it comes to curriculum, like they just keep going through yeah. the motions because that's what's on that paper. And yeah. you got to pull over and say, this isn't working. I need to do something. Different. They've lost it. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And our kids need to stand up, and they right. need to have the freedom right. to say, this is what I need. I right. shared a story about Curran about the shoebox. You know, you've heard Mary Al's story. He couldn't do a shoebox project in Minecraft. It had to be in that shoebox. And you think about that mentality, the old school mentality, and how that shift is coming. And it's not saying that that teacher doesn't have a good intention. Right. It just means we're repeating something that didn't work 20 years yeah. ago. Right. It's right. still not right. going to work today. Right. So, you know, you, you adjust, you modify, not because it's better for me or you or easier on you, but because you know it's best for your kids. And as a teacher, it brings so much more joy in your classroom. Mm -hmm. When you yeah. step back and give kids um, options and say, hey, who wants to sit up and grade 200 or 150 shoeboxes? Right. I'm going to tell right. you guys. So <laughs> no as, fun. Um, one, no of the things, fun. one of the things that I share with teachers is, okay, 
So we want to foster creativity in our students. And so I, I take them through what I call the creative process. Yeah. Um, it's a three-step process um, uh, where the students go through the brainstorming stage yeah, of the process. Mm -hmm. They go through the curation stage of the process. And then they go to the creation stage of the process. And the thing is, throughout each of those stages, you tell the students what you want, but you don't tell them how you want them to get there. You let that be flexible. But you still have a you have a rubric. You, you have a scoring guide that you use, and it tells, again, what you want, but it doesn't tell the kids how you want them to get there. And so they, they look at that, and they, and they see, okay, these are the things that you want me to do, and maybe as I am doing them, maybe one kid creates of code spaces uh, yeah. world. Maybe one kid, they, they do write the essay. Maybe one kid does a poster presentation. Maybe one kid makes a podcast yeah. or a movie. Maybe one makes a song, but they all get to that what, but they get to it in different ways. Yeah. Um, and they, it lets them play to their strengths um, that you still know, oh my gosh, they get it. Yeah. And whatever, the shoebox, oh, that, they get it. Don't bring a shoebox. But I didn't put them, I, but I didn't, I will throw that I didn't no put way. them no in way. a box right. and can find their creativity. Right. That's right. the key. Right. So you did and, and I was actually talking to someone else about this um, the other day. When, when the teacher says, do the project. And I'm not saying how you have to do it, yeah. but this is what mine looks like. Oh my like. gosh. And that's the worst thing that oh, you can do. Oh, it's the worst. And, and my kids will get upset with me because they're like, you're not going to show us no. an example? No, yeah. because I don't want 30 of the things that I show uh -huh. you. And that's what invariably happens. Yep. They think that's the yep. thing you want to see yep. regurgitated yep. back. Nope, no, that stifles no. creativity. Yeah, exactly. We have to stop educating our kids out of their creativity. Stop that. Yeah. Yeah. But we need to practice that in our PD, too. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing. I do a session. I'll do it tomorrow. It's called Game Maker. Okay. And it's, it's in the morning, I think, at 8. Um, and it is a very unconventional very frustrating very oh, yeah, like trying session yeah, yeah. and what happens is is the teachers come in and they think they're going to make a game or they think they're going to learn game maker which apparently is a software program yeah. um and what they do is they come in and i said no you're going to make a game well what is my game going to be about i don't know how is it going to be played don't know yet well what are my pieces what, what's the objective i don't know yet and so then they, what they're given is they're given the dynamics of creating a game. And throughout the process, everybody's game is different. Mm, I love that. But they're given little curveballs. So as they're going through, all of a sudden they're like, hey, do you have any new teachers in your group? Yeah. Oh, go get an extra item. So I give a certain amount of items at the table. They're given only so many can they grab. They have to maximize their tools. They're not told what's coming next. They're super, super uncomfortable. But it's fantastic because that's where we need to be. Yep. And when we talk about it at the end and we draw it all together and at the very end, their games are hilarious. They're fun. They go and play each other's games. They judge each other's games. They're competing like, oh, who got the best game? Um, you'd be all over that, Mason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in the end, though, at the end of this session, we can talk and reflect on how we do that to our kids regularly. But we don't practice that as educators yeah. Yeah. and how that is what PD should look like. Yeah. There's not an exact way of doing this, but I need to know that you got the skill down, Nicole. And to get there is how you're going to figure it out. I'm going to give you the freedom to figure it out. Here's some tools and resources, but I want you to still get there. You're going to get there differently and it's going to appeal to you. So, I mean, what would you guys say that is happening? We know this shift is happening. How does a school district, how does an admin start? Hey, Andy! We got oh, yeah. Andy. We are okay. live. He joined our Who Do It Live <laughs> from Region Seven. I think awesome. it's really powerful for people to see you as a learner. Yeah. Um, I, um, I, the teachers that I support, they say you are always doing something. I just launched a podcast Sunday. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it was because you know I'm I'm just continually learning. It's like okay, I see something, I want to go after it, I want to learn it, I want to do it. And I think the more that they see admin, and I really I don't even like the term admin because I think when you're in an administrative role, your job is just you're a teacher supporter. Support, right. Yeah. So when they see their supporters actually doing right. the thing that you're asking them to do, they become a little bit more comfortable. I'm constantly at a camp. 
I'm always reading books. I'm in book studies. Um, I'm listening to podcasts and sharing them. I started my own podcast. I'm on Boxer. A teacher will ask me, hey, do you know so-and-so? I will quickly say no. I don't know the answer to that, but I'll say, you know what? If you follow me on Twitter, I'm going to tweet that out right now. And I'm going to go on Boxer and I'm going to ask some people. I'm going to text some people. I just think once they see their supporters as simply lead learners, right. they get that learning book. Right. I can't even tell you how many people have come up to me and said, hey, you know that book? I want to read that with you. Or, hey, yeah. you know that conference? I want to I want to go to an egg camp with you. We're having an egg camp early college on the 17th yeah. because... A principal in my district has caught the ed tech, I mean, the ed camp book just from watching my tweets and seeing the wow. power of ed camp. So if you're an administrator, you are really the lead learner. Just just lead with your own learning. I love it. Mm-hmm. Lead learner. Mm-hmm. That's so powerful. Mm-hmm. Do you want to add to that? The only thing I would say is that one of the things, um, especially as we become leaders, um, we are expected to be the experts. And the thing mm-hmm. is, we are not, and that's okay. Educators are better together. And yep. so when you don't know, yep. you, you recognize that a shift needs to happen. Yep. Um, but you can't make that shift alone. You bring mm-hmm. experts in to help you and to help your staff so that you can help the students. Um, and so like my company, at Tech Teacher, we do personalized learning. We do help with personalized PD. And we help schools make that shift uh, through PD. And so when you don't know and the resources aren't there, bring in outside help um, so that you can uh, start to make that shift. I don't think anybody can say that they have it all down. And I think that's an important part of this, yeah. is finding uh, community. Kim Kim Lang came on yesterday to talk about the power of her PLN. That's, that's right. And she mentioned you most of the time. So <laughs> she said, she, she said um, she's going to, you know, ask an she issue. She's going to invoice, yeah, yeah, yeah. invoice you on that one. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we're, but talking about our people and our community and how important that is, I think that's absolutely a huge highlight on I wouldn't growth. know you without my family no. or no. Mason. I wouldn't I be mean, here. I think I may have met you on, I know. on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. And you were like, hey, you want to come participate in Egg Camp Global? I know. <laughs> so many people in, um, that I consider close friends yeah. um, that I reach out to when I get stuck or when my kids have a question on homework yeah. or a teacher needs something. They we don't get invited right. to a party I with Flipgrid. I know. <laughs> Hashtag not at the Flipgrid party. Hashtag not a, I'm crashing the party, y'all. <laughs> you didn't get invited? No. What's no, up? You know what? I don't you think the invite went out. I oh. think it was a link. So oh. funny story. That's we were funny. all invited, really. Um, That's but, funny. But you know what? The truth is, is that we have a community. We have a rocking community. These amazing folks, part of our learning ambassador program is just continuously sharing and investing into one another, not competition, not one up in each other, but really coming together and saying, you know what, I value you and what you bring to the table. That's right. Um, And so we, I've learned so much from this community. I'm learning so much. And and as administrators are making this shift and making this move, they're hearing the voices of their teachers, they're hearing the voices of their students. As they move forward, there's support out there. There's yeah. communities out yeah. there to support you. We have support for sure at Who Knew It, um, where we have modules to help support growth on all fronts and the people that are tied anything together. Anything you want to learn yeah. is on that side. No, anything. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I'll, just, like, I'll sure. just go through and I'm like, oh my God, this is on here? Anything. That's right. Anything. That's right. Anything. It's been a, a fantastic thing. So we are done for Who Knew It Live today. But- Woo!